When you walk into Sephora and you see that orange box, it will stop you to at least spark your curiosity. And I was just really proud that what I kind of envisioned, you know, kind of in your mind and in in your mental iCloud, that that was the reality and it materialized. Hey, how's it going? I'm your host, Adam Levinter, back with a new episode of Shopify Masters, your companion for starting and building a business. We know developing any new product is tricky. Then once you're happy with the product, you still have to find your brand identity. Well, today I'm joined by Jara Jamey. She'll break down the marketing strategy that has helped her brand take off from the second she launched into business. Her beauty empire, Ami Cole, celebrates melanin-rich skin with the products and tools she couldn't find anywhere else. Jara, welcome to Shopify Masters. Thank you. So as I understand it, Jara, you're the child of two entrepreneurs, right? Your parents are immigrants to the U.S. They've got this entrepreneurial background. What impact did your childhood have on who you become today as a founder? What a great question. Yes, child of immigrants. My parents, my father actually came here first. So my, my dad came here uh, earlier in 1980s and hustled his way after failing miserably in Paris, went back home, came to the United States and started kind of vending in the streets of, of New York City and then eventually working at a wholesale place and then would be starting his entrepreneur journey. But that's all important because I think we've always been operating um, in, a, in a mindset that we just had to do it. We had to figure it out. We had to pave the way. We had to understand the documents and how to kind of create a system for our families to thrive. Uh, my mom would come closer to the 1990s and she would, you know, begin her entrepreneurial uh, journey, you know, working at a hair salon uh, where she would um, still own the hair salon, uh, but she would create, you know, livelihoods for for herself, our family, but also uh, women that were similar to her kind of establishing their their footprint in, in New York City. But to answer your question specifically about like how that's uh, affected me, I think I've always been just very used to the hustle and bustle. Like we built everything. Thing. You know, if you have to paint the shop, we're going to go buy the paint. Uh, if you had to get new chairs, you had to go into the convention stores and buy your chairs. So there's something about building um, and having that kind of autonomy to, to create whatever you wanted to eventually have an output. So I think that learning and watching and absorbing that hustle, I think that's always been a part of me and, and still is. And also being so close to the customer. And you mentioned growing up in a salon and that's sort of sparking the passion for beauty and where you are now. You share this commonality with Michelle Fan, who founded Ipsy, also in the beauty space. I believe she also spent a lot of time in her aunt's or mother's salon. I forget who it was. But did you follow her story at all as you were building? Was she an inspiration to you? I mean, um, as you as you say, Michelle, I'm thinking of her beautiful, like soft, melancholy voice on YouTube. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, not too close. I do think that I was very inspired as well because um, I mean, she's one of a pioneer in many a sense on the, in the YouTube culture. And I think, you know, we'll talk about this, but my social media marketing career, you know, she being such a pioneer, I, I think I'd been close to her story and how beauty became almost a conduit and in, in a, in a place of escape for her in terms of dreaming and creating. So always appreciated her. Um, funny story, we actually were supposed to be on a panel together. I couldn't make it, unfortunately, but um, she definitely is like, you know, inspiration. And it, it's great to see like a, an immigrant story kind of come to fruition. Talk to me about that social media first approach to building a business. So she was early to this idea that people follow people before they follow companies. So build a following and then find a product or service to sell into that following. She was doing this on YouTube a long time ago. But for you, with respect to your following, was this always the strategy for you? Were you always going social media first, build a following and then developing a business around that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just going back and kind of sitting down and having a little bit more retrospective of just my life and, you know, how it all started, you know, the salon, my mom's business that's been there almost for 35 years now, it never was about her. You know, she fostered the space, you know, for people to feel safe and get paid fair wages and, and people in terms of customers coming back and getting that service. But it really was about the the shop, the music, um, the, the foods at the time that were served 
live there, the ambiance that she kind of created, right? So I think for me, it, it, it was always about community. Like, I think I'm the host. I, I would love to be the hostess with the mostest. Um, so even as a brand founder now, like, yes, I am the the voice or the face of the brand for right now, but my North Star is really to create this this kind of um, ecosystem where, where everyone is kind of sharing notes with each other and excited to be in this space or the, at the party together. So with that said, though, I think I was very just <laughs> very internet savvy and just nascent. But I think I've always just loved talking to people and kind of imagining this kind of friendship. You know, I, I was a pen paler. I, I would always be a writer in, in so, so, so many sense. So I think naturally social media created a space for me to talk to people and connect with people. And it's wild, right? I'm like talking to an older woman, 54 years old, that lives in Senegal, that lived in Paris, and we're connecting over beauty, over that La Roche Posay kind of soap or that P50, you know, toner. And then I think, you know, a little bit later on into the gloss being a, pa- a platform that just had a lot of space, uh, you know, for beauty concierge. So I was the Reddit reader. I was the the kind of commenter and trying to find my tribe on the internet. So it felt very natural to me. And then also lack of resources. The internet was free, right? I'm just putting out there like, this is what I have right now. And I think at the end of the day, it's about the customer. So how do I create a relationship with the customer to then, you know, gain trust with the customer, um, gain, you know, momentum with the customer, and then furthermore, hopefully convert her uh, or him into a customer. That's so interesting. And, you know, this whole idea of building no like, and trust is in the zeitgeist today. But this goes all the way back, in my opinion, to sort of 1929 Dale Carnegie stuff, right? Like, how do you win friends and influence people? It's a very important book that I read. But that whole idea that you got to go relationship first, and this applies not only to sort of building relationships one to one, but building companies, to me, that's such an important principle. So I love that you mentioned that. Your idea of using the internet to get feedback, talk to the customer, learn from that feedback. You interviewed, as I understand it, 400 plus people that you connected with on Instagram. Was this like an intentional product market fit exercise? No, not intentional. You know, I I hate to go back. Oh, that was genius. <laughs> no, really, I think I again lack of resources. I ca- I come from the world of L'Oreal, you know, prior to as well, where we had the kind of source of truth, this kind of spaceship of truth that was like NPD reports, Nielsen data, etc. And I said, like, I don't have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to tap into these reports. So, what is my end group? You know, how do I? get enough learning to understand like, okay, maybe, you know, if I even convert 10% of this pool that I would have somewhat of an audience to to be able to kind of sell a product to. And am I on the right track? You know, I don't want to just come out here, give you another product and make it about me. How do I make something that would service you truly? So I think that, again, throughout my career, I did a little bit of PR, social media marketing. I just kind of had this like black book, you know, whether that was beauty editors at the time, um, people that I work with, uh, you know, it's so interesting how like the New York City circuit is as well. Like I had been an intern at Teen Vogue and now those interns that I kind of co-interned with are now editor in chiefs that like, you know, at the cut, Lindsay people or working at Glossier. So it's so interesting to have your tribe and grow up with your tribe. So don't forget to look left and right. Those are the people that are going to be your peers eventually. Um, but going back to them and, and asking them like, you know, what's working for you, what's not. And at the end of the 400 women that I surveyed, I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew exactly what they wanted. I knew what skews, um, what kind of makeup style that I was kind of leaning into. I knew that they were hacking their makeup systems and maybe using this brand for that and this brand for this, but there wasn't essentially like a home for them um, to kind of have like a makeup uniform that they could add into their their routine. So um, it was important. It wasn't on purpose. Again, I think it was a lack of resource and just trying to be scrappy. <laughs> did the first version of Ami Cole, did that brand strategy that you first articulated in V1, let's say, Does that still hold true today, in your opinion? Yeah, I'm really proud that V1 of Amicole and our, and our product offering is still the same, you know, it's still the same. I think the mad, the the hardest part is scaling that. Um, and by scaling, I mean like multiple channels, like is our, um, our selling kind of technique true 
um, to .com, like amicole.com versus on Amazon versus on Sephora. I think that's the challenge. But um, essentially, like I, I kid, I would love, you know, the company to kind of be like the blue jeans, the perfect blue jeans uh, of makeup, right? Kind of finding that beautiful uniform that you can grab and kind of feel foolproof about um, and not really need like a pro makeup artist to teach you how to do X, Y, Z. You're kind of grabbing these essentials and adding it to your arsenal to kind of create the, the best version of self and optimal version of skin. Um, so that is still true for us, luckily. And we'll have an occasional pop of color. And, you know, that's what it is. Sometimes you want the, the jean with the flare. Sometimes you want the cut ups. But just kind of having those essentials in your in your kind of makeup uniform or arsenal. That's really our goal. So a little earlier on, you mentioned L'Oreal. You also have had stints at Glossier. You've had stints at Sephora. Sephora is a huge piece of your entire business even today. And I'd love to get that whole story. But before we go there, these various stints at L'Oreal, Glossier, Sephora, what did you take away early on that you've actually applied into your journey as an entrepreneur? Oh, absolutely. And I think this is so important because I think sometimes, listen, a job is a job, right? <laughs> sometimes you're in a job, you're like, oh God, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to move on. And you're, especially as an entrepreneur, um, when you're just kind of scratching and itching for the next thing. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I've always been a very curious person. I always want to know a little bit more. Like it, it just has to make sense in my mind. Um, so I feel like at every single role, I wanted to really understand before I moved on, I wanted to understand like why this was important in terms of like the the overall kind of workflow of a company and I think um, when I look at Temp2, for instance, Temp2 is a pro makeup artistry brand. When you think of Temp2, you're thinking like HD makeup, you're thinking about X Factor and kind of like a Hollywood world, like that level and that grade of makeup, but made for, you know, artists and then also consumers eventually where they had this big airbrush makeup machine. You would think like, okay, like why is that important, right? But to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with pro makeup artists that look at color in such a particular way, like the way that they understand color theory, application technique, how to hide a tattoo, the, the like how many layers of makeup you need to do that for it to look like just like skin. I was so grateful to, to have that experience, to understand, you know, the world of, uh, of that kind of ecosystem, you know, thinking about trade shows, et cetera. Then when I went over to L'Oreal, it was really trying to understand you kind of had this big box beauty approach. And when I say big box, I'm thinking like uh, Walmart, CVS, Dwayne Reed, kind of bigger um, impact and a little bit slower, right? So like what you do on social is not going to translate immediately at Walmart, but how as a collective, if you kind of do it the right way, how do you get collective voices talking about one product over and over again to then look at the overall market shift? So I think I got a little bit more data analytical. I understood how to play the long-term game. I, I understand how to stratify influence influencer impact and outreach between nano, micro, uh, mega influencers in like how to kind of work with EMV, earn media value at the time. And, and again, that was a little too slow for me. And then I went right back into like the craziest, wildest, fast paced world of Glossier, um, you know, right when the Series D hit and, and the, the, a, a wish of, of, of funding came through that kind of company and at the time it was the pinnacle of like all things disruptive. I mean, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned like what it meant to work work cross-functional in terms of working with regulatory, working with the art team, um, what it meant to really field community voices and really try to figure out like what is the next product for this company. And again, I, at each step, it took a amount of patience, but also understood like, okay, what am I learning here? What can I quote unquote say that I'm an expert at when I leave here? And I joke around with the word expert because honestly, you're constantly learning, but like, how do I gain enough confidence to then apply that to my next role or my next gig? I didn't know at the time. But at every single step, even working at Sephora, full-time college student, part-time working at Sephora, I understood how what it meant. I knew the vocabulary of, you know, being a cast member, working on the field, what happens backstage, what does training look like? What are girls that look like me? What are they walking and looking for? What was I selling them and how could I sell them? So I think even applying that kind of like on the ground experience and understanding like how crazy it could be at holiday and empathizing with the BAs, um, the beauty advisors on the, on the storefront. I have a different level of empathy when I walk into that store and do training now because I had been there before. So it's very interesting. Like the, the tapestry of my career has really made me equipped for this, you know, in many ways. So my business school has been my entire career. And now I've been able to kind of add that kind of concept to to what I'm doing right now. 
I definitely want to go deeper into your career tapestry. But before we do that, I'm going to pause and thank our wonderful audience for tuning in. Wherever you get your podcast, please follow and subscribe to Shopify Masters. And if you haven't already, write us a review. It helps other people discover the show. And our team absolutely loves reading your feedback. Let me just ask you about these experiences again uh, at L'Oreal, Glossier, Sephora. What do you think are some of the, like the, their unique abilities that say they do incredibly well? Like what separates a Glossier from a L'Oreal, from a Sephora that you could take away and directly apply into Amicole as you build that business? Oh, what an excellent question. First of all, Adam, I'm so impressed. These are, these, these are the best questions I've had in a very <laughs> long time. So I would say, you know, L'Oreal, they are very data centric. You know, a lot of decisions are really baked in pattern recognition and promise. And then they lean 100% into it once they understand and have collected enough data points to make sure that they can move and pivot the company to make certain decisions. So for me, that meant very tactically understanding how to use uh, social media listening, Looker versus this, tracking um, analytics on Google search. Like what does the momentum look like in terms of people and their behavior and their search and what are they looking for for us to then service them. Um, when we, you know, ran an ad campaign, were people particularly happy about JLo being in an LV uh, commercial? Like, what was the social sentiment? How do we change that? Is repair bond an actual thing? Is temporary dye a thing? So I think that using the collective data points to then drive you know, literally the industry and the kind of temperature was very, very interesting. And I think they do it still very, very well. Uh, Glossy, on the other hand, and people ecosystem, literally like we're inviting customers to the office to say, hey, do you like the way that bubble wrap sit on top of your makeup? You know, what about this eye cream that you really like? If you were to post this on your top shelf, how would you position this? Do you want this bottle to be opaque? Would you like an opalescent kind of um, radiance gradient look? How does this translate to a selfie? You know, this girl that's using a serum and pumping this into her, her skin or her skincare uh, routine, what does that look like? Or how does that photograph uh, at like a five o'clock in a Brooklyn, right? So we're thinking about the actual experience of the product in the, in the point of view of a real person. So I was able to kind of get that into it as well. And I think, again, temp two, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we cannot undermine the importance of pro makeup artists. They kind of drive the uh, trends, they drive the technique, they teach us, they kind of are the underbelly and the current of, of, our, of our entire, you know, uh, industry. Um, and, and hearing from them first, like, no, we don't need another one of this. We need this. We need, a, we need to double down on complexion. It's really not about the shade uh, depth. It's really about the undertones that we're missing. It's not about having 100 shades. It's about getting those, you know, 10 to 50 to 2050, correct. Um, so I think at each one of those locations, there was definitely an expert point of view that I'm now able to apply um, at my work at Amicole. So interesting. You use the word ecosystem, right, Char, with respect to what Glossier has done very well. The way that I think about it is community. How do you build a community around a brand? How do you think of your brand as a community-oriented brand? Do you feel like Amicole is that is this something that's kind of a North Star for you? Are you halfway there? Are you fully there? How do you think about community? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And going back again, like in terms of the hair salon, um, you know, that my mom had, it, it really is about community. Like, hey, girl, like I'm getting my hair done on Friday. You want to come meet me there? And we'll like, and you come there and you're sharing. I'm like, oh my God, what book are you reading? Oh, this is that book. So it's kind of like I am, my goal is to kind of create this spaceship, right? <laughs> you come into the spaceship, you enjoy the sense, you enjoy the music, the playlist is just right. How do I host the best party for you to come? to me every Friday or to tell your friend. I think success to me is like this person leaves the spaceship and say, oh my God, I had the best time when I went there. You got to try this product. You got to go to this hair salon. You kind of sharing that experience. Um, and I think the best news is that 
you know, Amicole still feels like a, a, a secret, right? It's kind of like, if you know, you know, it's kind of that gentle nod when you pull out that lip treatment oil, you know, at a party in Brooklyn and there's a, a girl across the way that's like, oh my God, I see you girl. And you're kind of pulling out your lip glosses together. Like that to me is success. And I think that is the, the fabric to create a life brand when people are just nascently talking about your brand and your products out in the wild. And I think that um, I was yeah deeply inspired by how uh, Glossier was able to do that. But I think it was always a part of me, um, especially growing up in, in Harlem as a first generation Senegalese American. All we had was community. If you didn't understand, you know, my father was the household that would, you know, help you break down a letter, you know, and say like, hey, this is what the government needs from you. They're asking you for this ID and this and that to, in order to get your immigration and just helping out and sharing notes um, and knowing like this is the house that you come for if you need help to translate this and that. This is the house that you come for if you need to Western Union money back home to your, your family because you, you don't have access to that. So it's really about using, you know, people within this ecosystem to kind of better your life and to not feel lonely, to, to kind of have a, a safe space of solace. And I think that we're able to do that through beauty. Circling back all the way to Sephora and getting the origin story of that, because they're an important pillar of the business at this point. And you started way back when as a beauty advisor. What's the origin story here? And where are you at with that partnership today? Wow. So Sephora is a deep story because it, it extends even beyond me. Like in high school, my older sister, she would always stop by Sephora and like grab fragrance samples. I'm like, where is this beauty carnival that you keep going to and coming back with free samples and like spritzing the entire house, our room, we shared a room. So I think that, you know, I fell in love, my entire family fell in love with Sephora because it was this kind of uh, premium prestige place to walk into and kind of get lost in beauty. My entire family just loves fragrance as well. It's actually my first role at Sephora working in fragrance world. So painting the picture for you, I'm a Syracuse University um, undergrad. I go to the mall. I'm working at Dillia's at the time. And then I I see the stripes. I see, oh my God, there's something happening here. The awning is just wooden stripes. And I'm like, I think there's a Sephora opening in a store at this mall. So I just kept watching, kept watching. And eventually the email opened up and I applied. I didn't even know how I was going to work these shifts. I don't know if it's the same now, but when Sephora stores open, there's an intensive training program. I think for like two weeks, you're like in, you know, an, an academy from like nine to like two o'clock. I don't know if I like ditched classes to be here or not. I don't remember the details of it, but I sure <laughs> I sure showed up and I did all of those courses and I was one of the founding members of that Syracuse University mall location. So fell in love, you know, again, like the brands were coming in, uh, Correz at the time, Lolita Lampica, if they all came in and explained, you know, why they exist and here is how you sell it. And I was just like, oh my God, I am in I'm in a great space right now. So I worked there, you know, um, at Syracuse while I was an undergrad for about two years. So all that to say, like Sephora is something that I knew very native to me and like all, all things beauty. Fast forward a little bit. Here I am creating Amicole and they're like, you know, what would be your dream partnership? I'm like, well, duh. <laughs> and listen, it didn't go smoothly. OK, my first conversation with them, they're like, oh, this is cute. You know, give me some samples. We'll give you feedback on the brand. I'm like, I don't need feedback on the brand. We're launching tomorrow. I need to know if you're going to take this brand or not. Um, I just missed by literally a hair of maybe two to three days their accelerator program. So I didn't qualify for that. So the hopes of being in Sephora felt very quiet, close to like zero. As the universe, you know, kind of did, did its thing. I'm a very big believer in fate and universe. I fast forward one year into Amicole's existence. Um, we're starting to talk to retailers, you know, including some of the competitor retailers. We're getting really close to kind of signing a deal with another retailer. And this WWD publication, we won an award. It was the Beauty Founder of the Year, I believe. And this is a very lucrative space. So like everyone from L'Oreal uh, to Estee Lauder to Sephora to Olaplex, everyone is in this beautiful breakfast and I am being awarded 
so I get on stage, you know, I accept my award. I'm all excited. I'm like seven months pregnant, kind of waddling <laughs> through the crowd. So Artemis and Allison Hahn are sitting in the crowd. They're like, wait a minute, we've heard this name before. Haven't we exchanged emails? I'm like, yeah, we exchanged emails, but your team hasn't been responsive. We're moving on to the next retailer. And they're like, no, no, no. Like we have to, we have to talk about this. We really believe in the brand. Um, I think there's some synergies here. Even if you don't go with Sephora, let's just have the conversation. So long story short, we signed that contract within like a month. <laughs> and we were literally launching within a couple of months at Sephora, but it took a little bit of zigzagging to get there. But what is yours will be yours, you know, regardless of what. And that's the the coming story of Sephora. How many Sephora locations are you in today? So we are in 277 locations and we're on Sephora.com as well through the next next big thing. Mm hmm. <laughs> I mean, when you walk into a Sephora and see Ami Cole on the shelves, like, what does that mean to you? How do you feel? I feel like sometimes I feel like someone made a mistake. I'm like, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm like, is, is this real? Um, especially the first couple of months, I'm just like beyond myself to see. I mean, it's definitely full circle, obviously, you know, what I what, what I just told you. But I remember creating the brand to have that orange box be able to stand out on black floors because I was thinking about Sephora. And when you walk into Sephora and you see that orange box, it will stop you to at least spark your curiosity. And I was just really proud that what I kind of envisioned, you know, kind of in your mind and in, the, in your mental eye cloud, that that was the reality and, and it materialized, you know, in store. So I was very proud about that. But then I just went into typical founder mode. I'm like cleaning up the shelves. I'm like, okay, do we have more inventory here? Wait a minute, what happened here? Why is this messy? Um, <laughs> so I get into that mode, you know, a lot, but I try to just kind of soak it in as much as I can. Um, I try to document it as well. Sometimes you'll see me in Sephora with a phone, just kind of just trying to really just remember these moments because they're, they never happen again. They're super special. And I just know how much work it took for myself, the team, um, whether that's packaging, whether that's my brand team, like all it took to actually get here. So it's still surreal, but it also reminds me I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Do they make you sign an exclusivity agreement with them at some point? Like, do they want exclusivity when you reach a certain level? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're definitely exclusive with them right now. Um, and they 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 want you to focus. They want you to really drive as much traffic as possible to that bay and to that shelf. Um, and then they want to invest in you in terms of marketing ideas. And if you're if they're marketing you and they can you can buy you everywhere, it doesn't feel as as special. Uh, I think that Sephora really wants to be that destination for discovery. Um, so they do try to hover over you and protect that as long as they can. <laughs> What is it like to, say, launch a D2C brand, then move to omni-channel, right? Go from D2C to smaller retail, to boutique retail, to Sephora. Is there a point at which this strategy kind of breaks down, if that makes sense? Yes, absolutely. Oh, I can talk about that ad nauseum, but... So in the beginning time, when we were, you know, pretty digitally native, it was a little bit easier. And easy and hard. I say easy because you can control your launch timelines. If something goes awry and someone in Italy decides to take a vacation versus getting on a production line, you know, you're not kind of like, you know, biting your nails to meet against these these supply chain and just demand and just getting things on the shelf because you can move that around. I think the problem there is it was very expensive to acquire customers, right? You know, like the meta model and all these other traditional kind of digital playbooks were, were going awry. There are more and more brands and it just became stiffer competition. Um, and then you had to really think about your cost of acquisition, your CACs and ROIs in terms of marketing efforts. Um, so hard and easy in that sense that you were able to control, but also really hard to get that customer on the website. Um, at Sephora and then continuing to kind of be omnipresent, it gets more and more complex, especially when it comes to inventory planning, especially your beginning years. You don't know, you know, demand. Um, is there going to be a viral moment on TikTok that's going to push up your demand and and kind of sell you out? Selling out feels really, you know, 
good on a marketing front, but really bad on a supply chain front. Like look at all the dollars that we're missing. Um, you know, like how if you're a small brand, especially like myself, your lead times might be longer than usual. You're not kind of churning out or sitting on tons of inventory because of cash straps. It just becomes way more complicated. <laughs> and there's so many factors that you got to be sensitive about. You have to be intuitive about and just real time reactions to understand like how to manage your cash flow. Um, and then still trying to acquire that customer. Customer. When, you know, a world like Sephora, as I mentioned before, a place of discovery, they're pumping out, you know, new brands, you know, every every other day, right? So if you're not a part of the newness chatter and you're not viral all the time, like where do you sit, right? Where is that kind of slow burn or kind of really uh, authentic, you know, kind of connection where someone is finding and loving and, and retention there as well? So I think that that's something that we're still trying to figure out, but it's way more complicated when you're omnichannel. Mm -hmm. Let's rewind back to your founder journey at Amicole with respect to fundraising. So, so many founders are going to be interested in understanding what it takes to pitch and close the seed round, which you've done very successfully. Back in 2021, you were one of 20 black women to raise over 1 million in pre-seed funding, which is incredible. Congrats. What are the three most pivotal things you take away from that process that you would share with these other founders who want to secure a big round? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's quite sad that it was one of 20. But yeah, it, was def it felt that way, you know, when I was pitching and I realized that you know, venture capital is very interesting. It started off in tech, you know what I mean? It's coming from the worlds of Facebook and, and fintech. And I think it's kind of um, diversified over the years into CPG, especially beauty, where the, the margins are super lucrative. And obviously, you know, if you if you hit it right, you can do it. You can get a, a beautiful multiple when it comes to exit. But rewinding back a little bit, because it started off in tech with a certain profile, um, we know what the tech, you know, boys club looked like. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to convince these people not only, you know, kind of educate about beauty and why it's important and, and the, the emotional kind of connection there is, but you know, why it was important to also hinge on diverse beauty, you know, why it was important to have not only just Fenty, but also beyond that, Fenty Rihanna's makeup brand, that we needed multiple brands. Like when I had to explain to them to bring it back to quote unquote simpler terms, like if you walk down the bread aisle, there are tons of options of bread, right? You would think, oh, do we need another bread? But there's someone that's gluten-free. There's someone who's allergic to this flour. There's someone who's on a diet looking for wheat. And it's, it's being able to kind of provide the essentials for that customer that is super loyal, looking for that right match in their kind of um, routine. Um, so going back and kind of explaining that was very difficult. And sometimes you're like, wait a minute, am I being delusional? Maybe there's a reason why this doesn't exist. Like, why, why am I creating this? And it kind of gives you this very dark cloud of doubt. And again, to paint this picture, I'm fundraising during 2020 when it's like, COVID. No one's wearing makeup. It's not in person. I'm, I'm like doing 150 Zooms. And, and I think by the like, maybe like 78th Zoom, I'm, I'm finally getting like, okay, I'll give you 15K. I'm like, wait, what? Can you can you say that again? I'm like, so I'm such in like autopilot mode you know, of this pitch. The person said yes. And I'm still answering questions. He said, calm down. I, I said, yes, just send me the documents. And then that in itself created this kind of snowball effect into many of yeses. But that first 78 meetings where you're getting no, 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 you're too small, come to us when you get traction, et cetera, et cetera, you, you kind of feel boggled down. If you're not optimistic, it can be a dark place for you. So I think that, you know, I had to have a level of delusion <laughs> and precede for those listening. That means before you actually even have product, before you even have a company, before you even have staff, you're trying to turn over every single rock to make sure that they feel confident that you are able to deploy capital in a, in a smart way and then convince them and then create traction. So it was very difficult. And luckily I had peers, you know, I was raising capital uh, the same time that Alameda from Topicals was raising capital. I had another friend that was starting a Better For You candy brand that was starting ca um, raising capital. So we were sharing notes and kind of being each other's cheerleaders. So it was a very special time, but it was very scary, but also I had nothing to lose. So I was like, let's go. This is, this is my job right now. Let me Let me secure that money. Is there anything looking back that you feel like you would have done differently to fast track things? I would say very humbly, no. 
only because I really, I really devoted everything into that. I really kind of thought through things. And again, being a hyper curious human, I just asked so many questions between um, former investors, people that I had worked with at Glossier, advisors and so forth, like how to structure the deal. Um, I knew that I think the only thing that I kind of toggle with right now, again, going back to the VC model, it started off in tech and the way that tech operates and the, and the, the margins there and the cost to operate the business is completely different from an actual physical good, right? So I think that, you know, it can be very challenging if your VC partner doesn't understand that and they're expecting like 4X, you know, in the next year, 10X within, you know, five years. It sometimes is a little bit slow of a burn. It costs a little bit more to acquire a customer, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't have the capital or the resources to bootstrap. So I I, I would say, you know, looking back, if I were to do it over, I would try to figure out a way to do it bootstrap, but I didn't have the money for that. I'm coming fresh off of my nine to fives. Um, so it was the only way to make this brand come to fruition. Speaking of bootstrapping and coming off of a nine to five, how can other founders who are very interested in potentially launching something but very concerned about leaving their nine to five because they don't have a nest egg to rely on or fall back on, how do you advise them to think about this problem of, say, when is the right time and having this ability to jump ship when you don't have a cash nest egg sitting there paying your bills, let's say? In the beginning, before I even, you know, had that investment during that 2020 year when I'm actually fundraising, um, when I'm actually kind of building out the idea, when I'm doing my consumer research, I took on a couple of gigs in terms of consulting. Again, my biggest overhead was my rent. So I kept thinking, like, how many clients I need to take in to, to pay my rent and be able to eat, uh, but also focus, like, literally majority of my time on this. If I wasn't uh, creating the idea, if I wasn't going out to Las Vegas, Prosmoprof, and, and certain conventions, if I wasn't talking to, to investors, you know, that it, it probably would, would have taken me longer, you know? Um, and that's okay, too, when it takes longer, right? I just knew that... For me and where I was in my life as well, just as, you know, at the time I was a single girl in New York City, I didn't have like, and now I have two kids and I'm married, it's a little bit different. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be heads down on this brand for about like seven to 10 years, right? And I bring that up because that also what is, you know, warranted VC because it can be a little bit faster paced. Um, but if you're thinking that you want to hold on to the brand and you want it to be a slow burn and you want to basically use cash in to kind of fuel your marketing, et cetera it might take a little bit longer and that's not a bad thing, right? It may take 20 years. Um, it may take, you know, as long as you want because you don't want to sell it or you don't want to have that kind of exit strategy. So you really want to know like, Number one, like what kind of life you want to live because it is high stress. Let's let's keep it very real. Um, having to go back out there continuously, you know, fundraising and raising capital and trying to kind of source the team. It's it's a very truncated, you know, sprint that can feel very taxing if you don't have the right uh, resources. What does it mean for you now that you are a parent and you do have two kids and you're building a business? What have you learned about yourself through this process, and what does it mean? building a business now as a parent versus say when you were single and thinking about this idea? Oh my God, it is the hardest, <laughs> the hardest thing ever. I'm going to be very transparent. There are definitely some breaking moments where I'm like, can I do this? And there are certain weeks, and I kid you not, where I'm taking it day by day. I'm waking up saying, you know what, I'm going to do the best I can with what I got because it can be very taxing. And, and you know what it is, especially as a parent, where, you know, I have two under two, they require all of you, right? I'm working from home. I don't have an office yet. We're not big enough to have an office. I'm working from home. My kids are at home as well. I'm wearing multiple hats, but I think at the at, at a macro level, I'm giving so much. I'm giving so much. And the sprint is in every stream of my life where I'm waking up. I'm not sleeping at night because <laughs> my newborn, I'm not sleeping at night. And then you're waking up and you're having to be on your P's and Q's. You're having to inspire the team. You're having to raise capital and convince investors to reinvest or to invest. Uh, you're having to make sure regulatory is right and that we're you know, standing the test of time at Sephora. We have to also be thinking five steps ahead on like what does expansion look like and working backwards from that. So it's very, very exhausting sometimes. Um, again, I think that I'm also grateful and I also, 
I think I'm rooted in the idea that this is temporary. The kids are going to be small, but so much, so but so long. Um, and hopefully by the time they're in first grade, second grade, maybe I'm, you know, in, in a whole different chapter of my career or of Amikole. Um, so I'm just realizing right now that it's very, very tough for me um, to be transparent and that I'm just trying to find ways to cope. For me, that means family. That means, you know, talking to other founders. That means acupuncture. <laughs> that means, you know, having physical therapy on my body to to literally mend my body from birth. Um, so it's very, it's a lot. It's a lot. I'm not going to lie. It's like I'm taking it every day as I can. <laughs> well, look at nothing worth working on ever comes easy. That's true. Keep at it. Jar, congratulations on Ami Kole and what you're building it's been a wonderful pleasure to talk to you and to meet you. Thanks for being here. Of course. Thank you. It's probably one of my favorite interviews. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate it. Thank you. That's Jara Jamey, the CEO and founder of Ami Kole. Our show is produced by Gogo Zoger and Megan Coyle. Our engineers are Matt Schwartz and Miku Betlam. Benjamin Gottlieb is our managing producer, and I'm your host, Adam Levinter. Come and hang out with us every Tuesday and Thursday to catch a brand new episode of Shopify Masters. And hey, if you're still here, go share this episode with another entrepreneur. 